Um, so good evening again, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Chantel Smith, and I'm the coordinator for recruitment and programming here in the Honors College at the University of Maryland. Um, we will be presenting a general overview tonight of our Gemstone program, which will be led by um, Gemstone Director, Dr. Dave Lugo, with some of our current students. So just a couple of notes. Um, this may be familiar if you're joining us from um, yesterday's chat, but there will be honors mission staffs along with current students available to help in the chat area. So feel free to ask, ask away, ask your questions that you have um, regarding academics, internships, study abroad, anything, you name it. Um, go ahead and access now and we'll do our best to get to each and every one of you. We will be recording today's session. So um, in the event that you wanna look back at this, um, it will be available on our website within the coming days. And so without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass the mic over so you can hear more about Gemstone. All right, good evening, everybody. I am going to share the screen so you can see some slides. Everybody see that? Very good, thank you, Rushi. Um, so my name is Dave Lovell. I'm the director of the Gemstone Honors Program within the Honors College. My job here tonight is to give you an overview of what the Gemstone program is, what it looks like, what it entails, and then as quickly as possible, get to a stage where we can take all of your questions and answer them. And I have a small armada of current Gemstone and Honors College students um, here to help me with that. There are some aspects of the program that they're actually better um, representatives and to answer the questions because as, as far as things like the student experience go, well, I don't know. Um, because I didn't go to Maryland. So, and I wasn't in Gemstone and they are, so they can tell you a lot about how those kinds of things work. So um, we're one of eight living learning programs in the Honors College and you're all admitted to the Honors College. So you're thinking about, well, which of these programs do I wanna to belong to? And um, you, you, eventually you'll only end up in, in one, but um, you get an opportunity to learn about them and then indicate your preferences. So, how do we work as well? Before I get to how do we work, let me, I'll give you a brief overview of who's with us tonight. So these are all the names of all the students that are with us, um, which class they're in. So you'll see we have students who joined us recently, all the way up to students who are, who are graduating this year. They're on a variety of different teams. They have all kinds of different majors. Some of them have minors. Um, and also you'll find our, all of our contacts, um, social media, how to reach us by phone, how to reach us by email. Okay, so what is Gemstone? So uh, Gemstone is a four year program. You would join us as freshmen and then you're all done right around the uh, end of your senior year. And what Gemstone students do is that they, they form into teams of eight to 12 students who are conducting research with a faculty mentor. So if you were to look for the one word that kind of sets Gemstone apart from, from all the other living learning programs, what's our main focus? It's research. Now you might ask yourself, well, what do we do research on? And the answer is pretty much everything. Certainly everything is possible. If it's being done on the campus of the University of Maryland, then we can do it in in Gemstone, it's just a question of getting the team to coalesce together that wants to work on that topic and then finding the mentor who can help supervise that. While we're doing that, we have coursework that you would take in your freshman and the fall semester of your sophomore year that gets you ready to form those teams, get you ready to form your research ideas. And then from the, from the second half of your sophomore year through to the end, you still take coursework, but it doesn't have prescribed content. It's essentially credit that you get for working with your faculty mentor on your research project. We have um, co-curricular leadership opportunities. So I'll show you in another slide, the vast array of opportunities you have both to learn and participate in leadership. Um, here's just a few examples of some of the topics that we're working on now. Um, so to give you an impression, you're, the students in Gemstone are on their research teams for their sophomore, junior, and senior year. So at any given time, we have one cohort who's in their freshman year who's forming teams and forming ideas, and we have three cohorts in the other years that are working on their, those teams. And we tend to have about a dozen teams in each cohort. So total, we have about 36 active 
research teams at any given time. Um, we have about 500 students overall, 120, 125 or so, upwards of uh, to maybe 150 in each of those cohorts. Um, so we have, I can't give you a list of all the things we're doing right now. I've only shown you six, but this is six out of the 36. And the one that you get involved in might look something like these, or it might look like something else entirely. Uh, what does our curriculum look like? So the first year, is basically a whole year of, well, what is research all about? What does it mean to do research? How do we do research? How do we do it equitably? How do we make sure that we find our own individual place in our research topic? How do we work together with a team? Um, there's a lot of details that are thrown in there. What if we're working with human subjects? What if we're working with animals? What about export control? What if we invent something? What happens to us then? Is there something, does the universe the university have any particular protocols for student inventors? Um, uh, lots and lots of different topics on how to do research at a university, both opportunities and some of the constraints that we have to operate within. Um, in your the early part of your second year, uh, you're finalizing your proposal for what you're going to do your research on. You're working on that with your mentor. You're learning a little bit more about research design and methods. And then your third and fourth year is basically when you are doing the actual work. So that's really heavy duty work with your mentor, meeting every week. Um, maybe your, your research involves working in labs, maybe it involves other kinds of things, interviewing um, survey participants, whatever it is, you do all of that. Um, your first part of your fourth year, you should be finishing up. The second part of your fourth year, you should mostly be done, although maybe some of our senior students will tell us that there's kind of a scramble right there at the end to get everything done. Um, together with your team, you write a team thesis and you defend and, pub and publish that final thesis. We have a thesis conference in, the, uh, in April of the senior year where all those presentations happen. And then we have a citation ceremony that sort of corresponds with commencement exercises where you would receive your gemstone citation and your gemstone medallion. And you could see a picture of what four smiling gemstone students um, look like when they're all done and they can, you know, sort of wipe their forehead and say, whew, and then move on to whatever's next in their life. Um, lots and lots of student engagement and leadership opportunities. We have students who are basically helping design and guide pretty much every aspect of our program. Um, and it doesn't stop when they're current students. We also have a very active alumni mentor and partner program. Um, our alumni board is very active. The freshmen already know them because alumni are coming back to help them with ideation. They're coming back uh, just this Thursday night. They'll be here. Some of the alums are coming to help them form their ideas. We do a GEMS camp in the summer. Um, that used to be for the freshman students. Last year, we did it for freshmen and sophomores because we had to skip the freshmen the previous year because of COVID. Uh, everybody seems to like it so much. We're trying to figure out a way to expand it to, to almost everybody who wants to come every year, which means more money. Uh, and so we're turning to the alumni to help with that. Arushi is acting like she didn't know that already, but I think she thinks that's great. So um, it really is a good time. Um, that's conducted out on the uh, in the uh, sort of Annapolis area. It's at this really nice camp facility, and there's a lot of really cool stuff that happens there. So that's kind of the, you know, come on board, getting to know everybody, starting to build a community. Um, we have peer mentor programs. We have the leadership council. We have steering committees for our coursework. You can be a teaching assistant for one of the courses. Uh, we hire quite a few of them. I think I have 20, 26 maybe teaching assistants working for me right now. Um, in the fall, we have about an equal number. So lots and lots of opportunities to get involved in leading and directing the program. What happens when you finish Gemstone? Well, you pretty much go anywhere you want. We have just countless um, examples. We've been, Gemstone's been around for a little over 25 years. So we have, I don't know, somewhere in the order, 1,500 to 2,000 alumni, something like that. They're everywhere. Um, they're, they finished, they're in or they finished grad school. We have many, many doctors, many lawyers, many veterinarians. They're out in industry. Um, this, it's such a short list. We put the ones on here that you would probably recognize uh, right off the bat, but the list is really, really long. Uh, where do folks end up after Gemstone? And 
Why are they successful in a lot of those things? Well, because they've spent four years doing, learning about and doing research. And a lot of, so if you were to go into a research oriented career, well, of course we're very good preparation for that. You probably need to go to grad school first and we're very good preparation for that. Um, at the same time, you can go into careers that don't necessarily have anything to do with research, but learning the research process, learning how to work on teams, um, can be very helpful, helpful in many, many avenues of life. Okay, so that is all that I had to show you in terms of a prepared slide presentation. Um, I'll leave that up for just a second, but what we wanna to turn to next is basically your questions. We're hoping that as many of these as possible will be out loud so that they'll show up on our recording. So, if you want to use the raise hand feature, I'm assuming you're all Zoom experts, probably better at it than me. If you want to do that, we will try to get to you, um, as many of you as, as we can. And um, if you have a question that you seem that you think is better suited for the chat, ask it there and my army of uh, teaching assistants is going to help answer those questions in the chat as quickly as we can. So, uh, Jenna Handel, please. Hi, I'm a student admitted for um, politics and government. So I was wondering how many of the gemstone students are humanities majors? Because I know um, research is often focused a lot in STEM. Okay, so uh, that's a great question. And I'll tell you one of the things I've been working very hard to disabuse our gemstone students of is thinking too much about STEM or non-STEM as a line of demarcation. Um, you have a major, everybody comes here, you major in some department, maybe you have a minor in some department. So are some of those departments considered STEM? Yes, but that's not really the point. Our research projects are projects that are of interest to society and our research teams, we hope, turn out to be multidisciplinary. The, uh, a, a research team is gonna have about 10 people on it. I don't see any particular reason for those 10 people to come from the same major. I don't know that that would be a particularly useful way to run a team because we're missing a bunch of talents that could have contributed to the project and aren't there. And the world doesn't really organize itself according to STEM and non-STEM. If you think of a project that you would, you know, some topic that you think is STEM and then ask yourself, could a sociologist contribute to that project? And the answer is absolutely. Um, now, to get back to the meat of your question, what fraction of our students come from um, like social science disciplines? I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, um, somebody from the Honors College might actually know that better, or maybe one of the students has a guess. I would say it's, we're probably half strictly what you would consider the STEM majors, engineering, um, biology, chemistry, physics. There is a decided component of STEM majors within the program, but, we have significant numbers in public health, sociology, psychology. Um, um, anybody want to, anybody have a better guess than that, Arushi? I don't have a better guess, but I'd love to jump in and say we definitely have a good chunk of humanities majors, ranging from English literature to business majors, info sci. I know somebody in the previous cohort who's an astronomy major. So definitely don't think that, you know, if you're not biology or engineering, that you can't do research. That is so not true. We are truly multidisciplinary. And also, fun fact, when a lot of people come into college, they tend to change their majors as well. So a lot of people might come in being bioengineering, some kind of STEM, and end up changing to something completely different. So don't let that uh, be a hindrance to, uh, to you joining. Right. And we want everything. In fact, it was one. So I've only been a director for two years. When I interviewed for the position, that was one of the things I said I was going to focus on, was trying to get better representation from across campus. So if you want to be in the art history department, you want to be in anthropology, you want to be in public um, planning, whatever it is you want to do, we will find a way for you to participate in a research project in, um, in uh, Gemstone. Sam Chernoff. Hi, my question is fairly similar to Jenna's. I know, I was wondering, do you have any specific examples of projects outside of the STEM field that people for taken in the Gemstone program? All right, uh, lots of students are shaking their heads, so you gotta do better than that. Turn off your mute and tell us what they are. <laughs> 
I can jump in again. Um, so one of my good friends is on a team called Team United, and they're looking at racial disparities in mental health care and diagnoses. Um, also, one of the teams in, I believe, Justin's cohort, the senior cohort, Team Flow, is looking at disparities in menstrual health knowledge um, between people in different socioeconomic areas. So those are just a few I can name. And, I, and, and again, back to my, my earlier point, think of what kinds of topics those teams are working on. Ask yourself, okay, what group of 10 people, what sort of distribution would we want in order to be useful? Could a computer science major contribute? Absolutely. Could a sociology major contribute? Absolutely. Could a public health major contribute? Absolutely. And in fact, the best team is the one that has all of those people on it. It's not just can they contribute, it's the fact that that actually makes for a better team. Um, but a different answer to your question, Sam, is, uh, and it's related to one of the questions I saw in the chat there, um, the teams form around their own ideas. So the, the research topics are essentially student driven. We bring in faculty to talk about some things that they're working on. So you get a sense of which kinds of things are possible on campus. You learn a lot about what lab facilities we have, you know, just and where am I going to find a mentor? So we, we, we do a lot of that. But in the end, the, the, the nuclei for all of the things that eventually become student projects are student project sheets, and those are developed by the students themselves. So if you have a particular thing that you're really interested in, and you can start to form a coalition of other students who are also interested in that, and you can get up some energy behind that, well, that's how things become projects. It's a grassroots sort of homegrown approach. Alexander Rosenberg. Hello. So I'm wondering, is it possible to do research at Maryland significantly with Alexander, I lost, I, I got as far as, is it possible to do research at Maryland? And then I lost. Okay, is it possible? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, is it possible to do research at Maryland without doing gemstone? Yeah. We're a particular program within the Honors College that's focused on research. You have many other, I mean, you have, again, a lot of these could just be grassroots. If you show up in some class and the professor talks about whatever and you like what they're doing, you go to their office hours and say, hey, I'm fascinated. I really want to join you. Maybe they have time for you. Maybe they don't. But if they have time for you, anybody can go work with some professor. Sometimes you can get paid to do it. We have formal programs, things like FIRE, things like Gemstone, that are really focused on providing research opportunities to students. Um, in, in your, it depends which department you're in. A lot of them have departmental honors programs where that have a specific research requirement within the departmental honors program. So yes, we are, a, and a little bit of this is nomenclature. We are a tier one research university. Our job, in addition to teaching stuff, is to research stuff. And in fact, technically our job's a little bit more on the research side than it is on the teaching side. So we research stuff incessantly and getting students involved with that is one of our priorities. Now you can imagine um, you contribute to research. The, the more you know, the more you can contribute. So um, um, a graduate student, clearly they have to do research. That's their whole purpose. Um, a senior might have taken, will, will clearly have taken a few more classes. So they probably have a bit more to contribute to the research endeavor than a junior and similarly working your way backwards, but everybody got there somehow. So you have to get your start somewhere and you could get started as early as your freshman year. That would take a fair amount of initiative on your part, but it can happen. Um, and really quick to tag onto that, I've been on kind of both sides with like doing research in Gemstone and doing research in um, on-campus labs. So I'm involved with like the biology departmental honors program and there are students in there who are in both Gemstone and the program and are able to do both. So being, even if you join Gemstone and you want to do a student-led research project on your team, you can still do individual research under professor and you're not going to be prohibited from doing that um, for doing both programs. That's completely welcome as well. All right, great question. Uh, Celeste Baskin. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask if there's like built-in funding for this research or how generally does it work? Thank you. 
there is some built-in funding for the research. So our teams generally get most of their money, well, let's say three different ways. We have a state line item budget to support gemstone research for our teams. It's, if you just average it across the teams, it's not enormous. It's, it's a few thousand dollars per semester for each team. Now, not all of them need it. So we don't just do a pro forma distribution of 1500 bucks to each team, but they come to us with, with requests and we satisfy those requests. Um, $2,000 might sound like a lot of money. It's not in the research scheme. We have some built-in grant support. We have, for example, a C grant um, um, that supports uh, certain of our teams. Not everybody's eligible for it. Your topic has to fit under the purview of what the C grant is trying to pay for. So we have those opportunities. Every team works with a faculty mentor, oftentimes in some sense, joining that faculty mentor's already existing research lab. So when you join with a faculty mentor, um, this is not a permanent employee of Gemstone. It's a permanent employee of the university. It's a professor in some department doing their regular work. Um, in almost every case, already tenured and with a very, very rich history of success in the research endeavor. So they might have, and in many cases they do have, lab facilities and grant support that's available um, to help pay at the very least for all the equipment and materials that you would need. And sometimes there's also uh, paid opportunities um, for student research. Um, the other thing that we will help students do is pursue any kind of outside grant support that they might be eligible for. And we work with them and with their mentors to help do that. Stephen Fung. Oh, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, my question was, as someone with an interest in computer and data science, um, mm -hmm. does any, is anyone in the GEMS program that's like in that area of study, could they talk about their experience with GEMS and like how that research helped with their own learning? Who do we have here from? I can talk a little bit about my team actually. So I'm on team DeBias, which is currently studying bias in AI hiring software. And we're trying to see if there's a connection between people who live in historically redlined areas and their chances of employment today. Um, so as you can see, our team has like a social science aspect and a CS or data aspect. Um, a lot of my teammates are CS math majors. Um, and it's been really cool for them because they get to apply what they learned in the classroom to a real world scenario. Um, we're currently doing some programming. We're hoping to develop our own AI um, and a lot of computer science things that I don't fully understand, but it's definitely <laughs> a good way to enhance your learning. Benchika, you're a CS major, right? I am a CS major. So I can actually talk about that. Um, I think I'm a CS right now, so in the introduction classes, but even learn in my gemstone been super super helpful and you know everything i know about things in perspective learn technical program the team that i'm on team doc is actually developing an ai to better detect for lung cancer so it is very data analytic based strictly on the side of cs you could say um within that i'm actually said team side i work a lot with data so on the time i'm really interested in data science ever since i joined it was really easy into that and see different portions of applying, you know, different types of models and science in applications. Um, and it was definitely really helpful for me in that section. Um, and honestly, it really has advanced the technical skills um, because you learn a lot of a lot about other things that you are taught in a lot of your classes. So it definitely helped advance my opinion as well. Oh, sorry, my AirPods are. Yeah, I think I got almost everything you said, but it was a little blotchy. We'll, uh, let's go with everybody heard what you said. And then if there's a follow-up question, we'll circle back around to it. Right now, we can't hear you at all. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add to that, so we, we, have, a, we have quite a few students in, in quite a few of the teams who are some version of computer science, data science majors. And the very interesting thing about computer science and data science, um, they work with big data. They almost never generate the big data themselves. The big data comes from some other place. There's some other corner of the world where something's going on that generates a lot of data. And then that data needs to be, um, you know, manipulated, interpreted, whatever. So we have 
I don't think we have a team out there that couldn't use somebody with a skill set coming from computer science, data science. Sophia Kucher. Yes, hello. Um, if you're in the Gemstone program, is it possible to also study abroad? Um, and yes. if you do, let's say for a semester, could you somehow still contribute like online uh, to your research team? Yes. So the answer is yes, yes, and yes. And in fact, there, anything that any other student could do, you can do in Gemstone. Of course, as you might imagine, it requires some, you know, some flexibility. So what you would do in that particular case is you would sign a version of a learning contract that says, okay, here, I'm going to be gone for this semester, but not really gone, gone, just gone physically, but you still need to continue to participate with your team and you and your team and your mentor come up with an agreement that says, okay, for the next, if it's a one semester or two semester, whatever it is, here's, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to do it. Here's how I'm going to continue to contribute so that, um, you don't get left behind because we really don't want it to be a situation where all of a sudden, you know, you shift and you're not really relevant with your cohort anymore. We want you to stay on your same team, participate with your same, with your same team. But we work that out in, in sort of a custom way for each person who's going to do that. Okay. Um, and by the way, I really like, I've led all kinds of different international programs at the University of Maryland. I really like them. I think it's a great thing for a young person to do is to leave this go country and go spend some time in some other country and learn a little bit. So um, you would certainly have my full support as the director when you were trying to do something like that. Um, Tushar Mohan. I have a similar question to the question that was asked about computer science and data science, except for physics. Um, yeah. If anyone here has any experience in that and how it's gone in the Gemstone program. We don't have anybody in our current uh, set of ambassadors here today who are in physics. I know the closest one to physics we have is Justin, um, who's in material science. And oftentimes people get those two fields confused. Um, but I don't know, physics majors, Gemstone, we have 500 kids. I bet we have 20, 30 physics majors in there somewhere. Um, so again, think of a project where someone who was an expert in physics couldn't contribute. It'll be tricky, right? Um, and, and the other way to think about this is, okay, you're coming here to, to the university, you're gonna major in physics. Is physics the only thing you're gonna do while you're here? I don't think so. You're going to, you know, you probably play intramural sports. Maybe you'll join some club. You'll eat food. You'll do all kinds of stuff, right? Maybe, and some people do this, maybe Gemstone is your opportunity to take a break from your major, but also get yourself engaged in another very interesting academic discipline because sometimes people have the bandwidth for things like that. So you don't necessarily have to find a way to shoehorn your major into your project. You can pursue a gemstone project is, that is of interest to you for other reasons and still do a great job at it and still crush your major. So um, all of those things are possible. Jenna, did we get your question earlier or? Um, um, this was an additional question. Okay, you're coming back around for take two? Uh, yes. Okay. I was wondering, um, in terms of graduating early, if that's one of your goals, do you think Gemstone is still a good fit for you? <laughs> yes. So the, the general, I laugh a little bit. So the general answer to is, you know, here's a thing that regular students do. Can we do that in Gemstone? And the answer to all of those questions, of course, there are details, but the answer to all of those questions is yes. In fact, we not that, so we have a prescribed time where we send around uh, an email. It's usually around November. We send it to everybody who is on track to graduate, not that coming spring, but the following spring. So we're getting them a year and a half in advance. And the purpose of that email is to remind them, by the way, if you're planning on graduating early, here are the steps that you need to take in order to make that work out with your Gemstone team. And again, it involves um, uh, uh, signing a learning contract. So you come up with this agreement whereby you and your team and your mentors say, 
you know, here are the things that I'm going to do in order to get myself graduated early. Here are the things I'm going to do in order to make sure that I stay involved with my team. We don't want you, for example, to graduate early and then not contribute one word of writing to the themes, team thesis, because then you didn't participate. So you still have to be involved. Um, sometimes people graduate early because they're continuing with a graduate program at the same university. So then it's quite easy. They can continue coming to the meetings. If they're going to another university, well, they can join the meetings virtually. And if it's uh, contributing writing to the final thesis and so forth, they can do that by email. So there's lots of ways to make that work out. Um, and we probably have, I think this last year I fielded um, 10, so 10 out of the 130 some odd people that are in that cohort are planning on graduating early. So yes, and we have lots of examples. So you wouldn't be making that up as you went. Uh, Parth, Desai. Yes, hello. Um, my question is that does the gemstone program more focus on applied research or is there also um, basic research projects as well? We have everything. Again, it depends on what the students uh, want to do. I think probably more of them, vastly more are applied than anything else, but we have some work going on in areas that you might think of as theoretical computer science. We have some work going on in theoretical mathematics. So um, really fundamental um, stuff in those particular areas that, you know, probably down the line somewhere it has some application, but they're not working on the application now. They're working on the theory. So we have we have students whose goal is to prove something and they're, they're working on that. Um, it's in the area of uh, one particular team. It's in the area of internet security and strong passwords. Um, but it's not, it's not deployment of those kinds of things. It's not so much the computer programming, it is the mathematical theories behind why those would be good ideas. And we would be amenable to that. We've had students who were doing research in English literature. We've had students who were doing research in philosophy. We've had ethics, we've had law, um, if you look back over the long history of Gemstone, we've had all of those things. And in many cases, um, I don't think you would categorize them as applied. I think they would be fundamental research. Tushar, did you have a second question? Are we coming back to you? Yeah, my other question was, uh, what kind of time commitment would you say Gemstone requires? So the, uh, I'll let the, I, I've been talking too much. I know the answer, but I'll let the students answer that. So I can kind of jump in and I guess I'm slightly biased towards the higher end because I've also been involved in a little bit of the co-curricular type of leadership that Dr. Lovell briefly mentioned during his presentation. Um, but like almost every other answer, it's going to vary, especially depending on the point uh, in time that your team is in the research process. So like Dr. Lovell said, towards the beginning, especially once you form your teams in sophomore year, it's gonna be a lot of literature review and coming up with a proposal. Um, and you know, that workload might be a little bit lighter. That might be reading, you know, a couple articles a week, writing up summaries, talking, or, talking to your team, presenting relevant ideas, et cetera. Um, but once you get towards junior year, you might be spending a little bit more time in the lab or in, out interviewing people, uh, things along those lines. So you may see a slight increase in, um, in workload. Um, and again, senior year, it might change once you have different tasks that skew more towards the data analysis and writing side of things. Um, additionally, like Dr. Lovell said, there are awesome co-curricular type of opportunities that you can get involved in, uh, such as the Gemstone Leadership Council, which is kind of our student leadership body that houses a bunch of different steering committees that work on big objectives like engagement with alumni or first year mentorship. And I would say, you know, that does add on a couple hours a week, but broadly speaking, it's a really fruitful experience um, that enables, you know, students like myself to not only develop leadership skills, but also give back to the community. So I would say, you know, it is, it is a decent number of hours a week that will vary along the, um, you know, the time axis of your, of your uh, tenure at the university, but it's worth it and uh, it's definitely manageable. Um, Katie asked a question in the chat that was related to um, study abroad. I wanted to get 
get back to that. She asks if we did want to study abroad, what would be the best time? Um, I don't think there's a universal best time. I think probably most of our students tend to do it in their junior year, um, partly because there's a lot of moving parts there. Um, th there's a that would be a reasonable time with your gemstone team. I think they could suffer your absence during that time. You could still contribute. Um, but it also has a lot to do with, well, while you're studying abroad, you're taking courses and those courses need to count for credit in your major. So there's a lot of interface that you have to do with your advisor in your major to make sure that the place that you're going is offering courses that you can take that will then have credits that transfer back to the University of Maryland so that that study abroad doesn't just end up slowing you down for a semester or for a year. Um, we don't really wanna think of study abroad as vacation abroad. We wanna think of it as study abroad, which means you have to take courses and you really want those credits to be transferable back to your major. Um, Jordan has a question about the GoFund. I'm gonna ask you a question first, but Jordan's question is how much do, student, do Gemstone students receive money from the GoFund? So my question for you, Jordan is, and maybe I missed this in the chat. How did you hear about the GoFund? I just got a link to it in the chat. Oh, okay. So they can be around, Arushi says they're around $250. It's, it's basically, it's kind of an as needed sort of thing. You make a request and we hum and haw over that request. And if it seems reasonable, we say yes. Um, and uh, and uh, we pay for it. But, you know, on average, if you have something that you need that's in the $250, you know, on the order of a few hundred dollars, that's something that we would consider reasonable. That makes Dr. sense. Thank you. Dr. Lovell, can I actually jump in on a question from the chat here? Yep. So Hannah asked a really great question on what made us choose Gemstone over any others. I feel like this might be a good one for people to hear. Um, if I could share a little bit about why I picked Gemstone. Um, the two things that stood out to me were the team aspect and the directed research aspect. In high school, I was somebody who was on a sports team. I was in like orchestra and jazz band. So it was a lot of team-based things. Um, and I'd never done research before. So the idea of working with other people was really appealing to me, as well as the fact of uh, you're doing your own research in the sense that it's your own idea, you're developing, developing it by yourself, which I thought was really special. I don't know if anybody else wants to talk about why they picked Jumpstone. Um, I can jump in on this one. So I'm a little different where I actually did some research in high school, but a lot of that was working under professors that were at UMD. And so I was pretty much a research assistant for all those lab experiences. And I didn't really have much control of the things that I was doing. Um, and so when I saw that Gemstone was essentially like student led, um, a student led research experience, I knew that I wanted to do that and I actually was able to propose my own project and that's what I'm working on in my team. So it's definitely been a really great experience. And just, um, especially if you want to go to grad school, it's a really great experience for you to have in undergrad, like being able to work in a team um, and kind of writing a thesis and writing a proposal. So all that is really important, especially if you want to go to grad school. Jordan asks, um a question that allows us to talk a little bit more about some of our process. It says, do Gemstone students regularly partner or get advising from outside companies or is it mainly based around research institutions? So um, there's a couple of touch points along the way. The sophomores right now are getting ready to defend their research proposals. And part of that, and everybody who used to, who did that is smiling, they remember that step. And part of that step is you have, in addition to your team, and your team mentor. And we haven't mentioned yet that every team is also assigned a librarian. So you have a permanent library staff member from the university assigned to your team who helps you with your research endeavors. Um, in addition to them, you also have to dig up another expert. And typically at that level, that's somebody else from campus who's also an expert in that particular field who's helping you form your research idea. Now, when you get to your final thesis, your final thesis, um, is presented in front of a group that includes 
uh, some people from the Gemstone program. It includes your mentor. It also includes a set of what we call discussants. And you have to recruit at least four discussants who are who generally are your thesis committee, if you want to think about it using the, the language that you, you, you would use in graduate school. These are the people who are reading your thesis, who are giving you feedback, asking you questions, giving you suggestions, and so forth. And those can come from anywhere. If your, if your research involves something that some outside company is also working on, we have experts coming to us from pharmaceutical companies, automotive companies, companies, uh, you know, the sort of Lockheed Martins of the world, those kinds of companies. We have outside experts coming from lots of different places. And that's just basically something that you and your mentor, you would become familiar with the whole academic space around your research project. And oftentimes it's not limited to um, places like universities. It can include industry and it can include government. We have a lot of our experts who come to us from various government agencies. You can, we do a fair amount of of work related to the health sciences. So you can imagine we have people coming to us from NIH and from places like that. I'm scrolling up through the, uh, I don't see any other raised hands. Um, Krishna asks, for those students who are pre-med, do they have enough time to study for MCAT while managing their gemstone research? Um, I don't mean this to sound too flippant, but history would suggest yes, because our, um, our pre-med students tend to go on to be med students, and then they tend to go on to be doctors. And we have a very, very strong record of success in that area. And a lot of times they come back as alumni and they're helping. We have a couple of them uh, who came uh, uh, last week and a couple of them coming back this week to help the next generation of uh, gemstone students figure out how to navigate that process. And one of the things that's great about that is, in addition to helping them think about their research, our alumni, you know, they're coming back from having successfully navigated the, the, the process of getting into a career. And in many cases, the process of getting into a career, deciding that wasn't exactly the career for them, and, and picking another career. In fact, one of the meetings that we, that we the last couple of years we've hosted every fall is this meeting that we call career zigzags. So we have alumni come in and talk to us about, you know, here are the actual things that can happen to you in a career. You get into this thing and then you discover something else while you're there. You make a lateral move into something else. And why does a program like Gemstone um, build uh, or help you develop skills that are necessary for having that kind of flexibility, having that kind of, uh, let's be honest, courage to, to, to pick one path and then part way down that path to say, you know what, I actually like this other path better. I'm going to go that way instead. And um, what, you know, what experiences do I have in the, from my educational background that are going to help support that move? It turns out there's a lot. And uh, those, uh, we have alumni who come in and help the students sort of understand that. And part of what they're trying to convince them, of, I think, is, you know, don't be, don't be too stressed about your major. You, of course, you have to pick one. So pick one you like. but don't think that that's a pigeonhole. If you decide later that that's not what you want to do, well, fine, go do something else. Um, I mean, me and my, my undergraduate degree was in math, but then I decided I liked engineering better. So I went to graduate school in engineering. Um, and then, uh, then I said, okay, well, graduate school in engineering is fun, but I really want to go into academics. So then I, I became a professor and then I've done, you know, I've been here 25 years. I've done 50 different things uh, along those lines since I've been here. And I've changed my research area, you know, 15 times since I've been here. Um, always, you know, looking for something new to work on, something different to study. I've written papers on sports. I've written papers on traditional engineering topics. I've written papers that are much more mathy, um, all kinds of different stuff. And I'm just using myself as an, as an example, but... Um, um, yeah, people, you know, you can go all over the place. I don't, I'm, in fact, I'm to the point now where I forgot what the original question was. Was this, where was I starting from? <laughs> we get so excited about explaining all this stuff to people that we, uh, we lose sight of where we are. Arushi has some very good stuff in there on MCAT, LSAT, all of that, all that study. Dr. Lovell, there was a question much earlier in the chat that was answered, but I wanted to bring it up um, so that we could hear the answer verbally. 
Um, and the question was about what are the benefits of being in GEMS rather than just doing individual research or helping a professor with their research? Yeah. Okay. I'd love to hear some of the students answer that question out loud. Okay, great. So don't say all of them, just pick a good one and then, and then hand off. Um, yeah, so I can start with this, um, having been on both sides of it. So Gemstone is very much like more, I think I might have answered this in chat too, but um, just to reiterate, Gemstone is very much more collaborative. So you will be working on a team of students where you will be asked to like, you, you basically just have to put in as much um, effort as each person on the team so that you make sure that you guys are all reaching a goal together. Whereas doing research under a professor can be very individual. Um, so for instance, under a professor, I have my own research project that I'm writing an individual thesis for. Um, and that is a very stark difference between Gemstone and doing individual research. So um, I would say that the biggest difference is team collaboration and being able to put ideas together with other people to formulate your own project and to really be the driver for it forward, um, where you are doing the proposal process. You're taking it kind of like Dr. Lovell said, from a grassroots way. Um, and that's really what Gemstone will offer you. Also, the level of involvement, I think, varies a lot because sometimes if you're working with a professor, it may be specifically for data collection or for data analysis versus with Gemstone. You are in it every single step from proposing the project to developing the methodology to presenting it at a conference. So after your time in Gems, you can literally say, like, I have experienced researching other literature. I have experienced um, submitting IRB approval if you're using human subjects, which are skills that you may not necessarily do if you're working with somebody else's lab, which I think is very unique. All right, I'm still scrolling up. Looks like there was lots of good questions. And Jenny, if you think of any others that, uh, there's a question about uh, space science. Yeah, we have a ton of that. In fact, a couple of our recurring faculty mentors that we can't even seem to get rid of them. They just keep coming back and coming back and they, they, uh, they do a lot of space science. Um, if you have an opportunity to come and tour the University of Maryland, you should try to squeeze in the neutral buoyancy facility. Um, it is a fascinating space and they do really cool stuff in there um, and if you find yourself working in there you might find yourself getting uh, scuba qualified and then you'll be swimming underwater in scuba gear helping them test various kinds of space robotics in the closest thing we can use to approximate uh, zero gravity which is neutral buoyancy which is why it's called the neutral buoyancy facility and they have done all kinds of NASA related projects in that facility um, and other kinds of projects too but a lot of stuff is NASA related. Um, one of the original space shuttle arms uh, was tested in that facility to see how those kinds of things would work. Um, even things with uh, astronauts doing extra vehicular activities. So colloquially, we call them spacewalks, but you, you're floating outside the spaceship, usually because you have to repair something on the spaceship. And all the rules that you learned about fixing stuff down on Earth don't work because everything that you that every time you turned a wrench or pulled on something or pushed on something, whatever it, is, it was that you did while you were standing on Earth, you didn't notice it, but gravity was helping you do that. It was giving you a reaction force to push against the other thing. Now, all of a sudden, you're in space and you're trying to turn a bolt on the outside of the spaceship, and it turns out the bolt doesn't move. You grab onto it with a wrench, and the only thing happens is you move yourself up and down. You don't move the bolt at all. So you have to learn entirely, astronauts have to learn entirely different physical techniques for doing manual work on the outside of a spacecraft. And um, one of the places they can do that is getting themselves in a scuba suit and becoming neutrally buoyant and trying to do those stuff, uh, that kind of stuff underwater. Um, so that's a really great facility. They give tours regularly. I've taken probably a hundred student groups over there for tours. Um, and several of the people who work there regularly are current um, faculty mentors for different teams on Gemstone. Talk about Gemscamp. 
camp. So somebody brought up camp counselor. So that's Jim's camp. Why don't, yeah, students, tell us what happened to Jim's camp. What was it all about? So glad you guys asked about Jim's camp. It's the first thing that you do. Um, it's an opportunity for first year students to get to know each other and get to know Gemstone a little bit before the semester starts. So you actually get to move in a couple days early, which like pro tip, do it. You avoid the chaos of move in. Um, and you get to go to this camp, it's by a river, and they put you in little camp groups and you get to know your peers. And it's super fun. You get to do team bonding activities. You get to know about Gemstone, talk about research ideas. Um, we make s'mores. My, I just have this vivid memory of being in the cabin late at night playing Mafia. Rocky, I think you were there too. Um, it's honestly such a good time. It's, it's a good chance for, so like I said, that used to be just limited to the freshman cohort and it was really a good chance for them to get to meet each other. But now that we're trying to broaden it into more cohorts, it's also a good chance for you to meet the students who are in the cohort ahead of you or two cohorts ahead of you. And that turns out to be really, really important because you're gonna find yourself in situations where you're not necessarily sure how to proceed, but the classes in front of you have been in those same situations and those people are still around and they can help guide you through some of those processes, reduce the stress level, give you some suggestions, give you some tools, give you some people that you might talk to, uh, but that only happens if you actually know those other people. So we're trying very hard for Gemstone not to be strictly partitioned by the cohorts, um, but to have a lot of cross-disciplinary or cross-cohort activities. And that's a lot where the, where the engagement part comes in as well. Our, our leadership council, frequently what they're working on is, okay, what is our next ec extracurricular activity gonna be? Whether it's, we convinced the dairy to make us our own special uh, flavor of ice cream and then we we bought a bunch of it and gave it away and we have a big session where everybody comes together and gets all the free ice cream they want um we had uh gems formal which was a dance where um the students went to this formal dance there was a photographer there there was a dj they did all of that so every gemstone student and i think they could all take a plus one so that there was like i don't know 150 students who went to that um it was very successful so Activities like that are also sort of embedded in the engagement part. And we have a permanent staff member whose job is student engagement. So her, her whole focus is finding ways to take Gemstone and expand it from just being an academic program into something that feels a lot more like a community. And Jenny, you say the ice cream from the dairy is good. And I yes. agree entirely, but you haven't tasted Gem's Cone. And Gem's, <laughs> Gem's Cone is awesome. Excellent. I can't wait to try it. We'll, we'll get you some. There might be one still in our freezer, but I think that one is um, pretty crystallized by now. We'll get you a real <laughs> one. When we, this spring, we'll do it for real and we'll get you one. Sounds great. Um, I wondered if the students could talk about their experiences in the residence hall. This might have to be the last question. There have been so many great questions, but I think this is um, a really valuable question for our admitted students. So I was typing out a response to this in the chat, actually, so I'll just say it out loud. Um, Ellicott is not one of the newest dorms that have been built. So you might have already heard of like Townshend Hall and stuff like that that were built for like UH. Um, so it is not the newest, but it is very conveniently located right next to the diner, which I really enjoyed um, because I could just waltz down, get grab food really quick and leave. Um, and it's also adjacent to La Plata Hall, which you will get at least for my year, I could be wrong now, but I got access to it through my swipe because the honors lounges are in the basement of La Plata Hall. So you have like study rooms that honor students can use um, in La Plata. And so you'll be not only around gemstone students by living in Ellicott, but you'll also be around honors college students because the adjacent um, residence halls are also home to other honors programs. So it makes it for a very nice community. Also Ellicott is, oh, I'm sorry, Justin, you go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, one of my favorite parts about Ellicott, it isn't the prettiest building. I think anybody that's in the Gemstone program can tell you it, it might not be the nicest building ever, but one of the strongest senses of community, like Dr. Lovell mentioned community at least once. Um, you're really able to find community if you're going out, you're hanging out in those lounges, like those lounges, you're going to have one lounge per floor in Ellicott Hall, 
everyone seems to gravitate towards that lounge. No matter almost what time of the day it is, you're going to find someone in there. You can find someone to talk to. Might not be the best place to do homework since, you know, there is usually a little bit of commotion going on. But, you know, being able to just hang out with people in those communal areas really does help meet people and build a sense of community with others uh, that you're living with. So you can go ahead, Arushi. No, thanks, Justin. I was also going to point out that the Gemstone office is located in the basement of Ellicott. So your first year courses will literally be held in the basement. Um, I had like a 930 Gemstone class and I woke up at 925 a.m. It was awesome. Yeah, we uh, we haven't yet imposed a strict uh, showering and teeth brushing regimen on the students who do that. But, uh, you know, maybe someday we'll get around to that. But it is nice to be able to roll downstairs in your freshman year and kind of come into the office. The staff are all there. So if you need something from us, there are team rooms in there. When they're not officially being used for the courses, they're available for your teams to meet in. You can schedule those. It's actually, as office space goes, it's pretty nice. There aren't very many student groups anywhere on campus that can reserve the kind of meeting spaces that we have. They all have big tables, whiteboards, uh, projection or uh, uh, monitors on the wall. You can plug in your computers, you can do all of that stuff. So um, we're pretty well situated. Ellicott is also right next to the gym, the Epley Recreation Center. So you can roll out of there. And um, if, if, uh, if you have time, get over to the gym. And there's an outdoor swimming pool that's open when the weather's nice. And if you want to go to football games, we are right across the street from the football stadium. So all righty guys. Let me get back on camp. Oh. Brian's asking about air conditioning. So that's a good question. And we don't we we don't it's not a good idea to sweep that one under the rug. No, it does not have air conditioning. So for the first, well, let me caveat that. The individual rooms don't have air conditioning. The lounges do. So what people do is for the first couple of weeks of the freshman year, when it's still warm outside, they shove all their stuff in their room and then they try to spend most of their time out in the lounges, which is fantastic because then you get to meet everybody anyway. And fans. Bring in fans. They will let you have fans. If you try to bring in a portable AC, um, they won't let you do that, but you can bring in a fan. And it's really only a couple of weeks. It's not that bad. When you first are standing in there, you're like, oh man, how am I going to survive? You know, I'm going to be here for four years. Well, it's only two weeks. It's not four years. And then the weather cools down and then, you know, and we do have heaters. Those work quite well. So every, the heat in the building is quite, quite good. All right, thank you guys. Um, we're actually getting ready to wrap up and move on to our next